welcome everyone as you come. And I, uh, I'm excited to have, to have uh, the February meetup this month. We're gonna get started with some announcements to get everything going. Uh, first up, we always like to start the meetup with who's hiring. Obviously, we can't exactly do that right now because we're in this virtual world. Hopefully soon we'll get out of the virtual world, soon being relative. So if you have a job, if you are looking to hire someone, go to the NY Hackgar Slack and go to the job postings channel. Put your job in there. Hopefully you'll get a bunch of people applying and hopefully one day soon you could get their applications in person. I wanna thank EcoHealth Alliance for sponsoring, uh, for providing this Zoom, uh, Zoom session for us. And they would actually like to announce that they have a job they're hiring for us. So that'd be pretty cool. Hi, thanks, Jared. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emma Mendelson. I'm a research scientist at EcoHealth Alliance. And we are hiring right now for a data librarian. It's going to involve a lot of working with teams across the organization to help them figure out their data management needs um, and to provide some support with data analysis, visualization, also some engineering. Uh, so it's a super nice chance to work for a really great organization um, to help us build new tools and systems and to help us develop best practices for data management. Um, we're looking for someone with strong R skills, data organization skills, and we're also especially interested to hear from folks who have knowledge of the scientific publication process and familiarity with the ecosystem around um, scientific archiving and metadata. So if that's interesting to you, the post is online at our website. And also please feel free to reach out to me, um, Emma Mendelson or Noah Ross, who's the supervisor for this position. Um, we're both on the New York R Slack channel. Thanks, Jared. Great, thank you. And since I'm on camera, I am hiring. I am hiring an account executive. So you wanna join my company to help bring R and Python and data science machine learning in general to companies. We are looking for someone with technical experience to help along the sales process. And you not only get to just help grow the company, but help with the conference and make people really enjoy these open statistical tools. So if you're looking to maybe do some sales, you know someone who, who likes sales, send them toward me or send yourself. So the pizza this month is coming from a local place called Marco's. See, we have good cheese lock, cheese isn't sliding. You see, based on the uniform color, it was made in a gas oven. And I'm looking forward to trying that. So I hope everybody else, hope you got pizza from somewhere good, somewhere local near you. Uh, let us know, let us know in the, in the chat or in Slack where you got your pizza from. Hopefully we can uh, all live vicariously through each other, all these different great pizza places. Hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, so again, we're all used to this by now, but I know not everyone here has been here before. We're in virtual land. So if you want to chat about what's going on here and check out this uh, cool talk, we have two spots for you. You can go in the chat right here in Zoom, or you can go into the NY Hack R Slack. There is now a chat called Monthly Meetup Chat. Um, it's the same one we've been using for the past few meetups. We just give it one name instead of keep changing it. So go to Monthly Meetup Chat in Slack and ask questions there. What we're gonna do is you folks will ask questions there. I'll compile them all at the end and I will ask them of Andy at the end. This way we can get everyone's questions in. So again, if you wanna ask a question, you just wanna chat about your pizza or about how the talk's going or about anything else, go to the monthly meetup chat. For those of you that are new to the Slack, we have lots of channels in there, including R help, Python help, Git help, stats help, all sorts of different help channels and an events channel, if you wanna learn about events that are happening and a job posting channel and many other private channels and public channels that I'm not even aware of. Uh, some other news, we just last week posted all the videos from the R and government conference. They're all online, freely available to get. You go to rstats.ai and there's a video button and they're all in there. So again, I'll put that in the group chat actually, rstats.ai. Uh, you click on the videos and actually you'll see six years worth of videos between the New York and the Washington and the government conferences. So there's lots of videos up there. Speaking of videos, uh, we posted the January meetup video last week also. So if you want to find that video of last month's talk, you can go to nyhackr.org and click on the presentations link and you'll see um, last month's video, the past eight years worth of videos. There is a bug in the website I discovered that in the table showing the information, you might need to resize it to get to the videos. So we are redesigning that, but 
all the code is up on GitHub for that website. So if you want to help redesign both the website and the table display, we'll take a pull request. Um, because right now we're working on it, but we're always open to people who could do better designs because I designed the first one and I don't do design. So it'd be great if someone else actually knew what they're doing, made it look pretty. Next month, we have Garrick Adam Bu, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Garrick, if you're here, I apologize if I got your name mangled. He'll be speaking about Sharingan. I am super excited for this talk. Sharingan, as a lot of you know, is this uh, popular slideshow format in R. He's going to give a whole talk about Sharingan and Sharingan Extra and a whole bunch of cool stuff. In April, we have Klaus Wilkie talking about how to use R and Rust together. You might notice today's talk has a, has a bit about Rust. In April, we're going to talk about how to call Rust functions from R. So we're super excited about that. And then in May, we have James Lamb, who's going to talk about light GBM. For those of you who don't know, this is a competitor to XGBoost. And depending on the benchmarks, it's either faster or more accurate. Uh, so it's going to be really cool to see that talk. I am super excited about them. They're recently getting themselves on CRAN as GPU support. So that's going to be a really cool new addition to the R ecosystem. So with all that, we have a talk today about Arrow. Um, those of you who know, I've been uh, trolling Neil Richardson a little bit on Twitter about Arrow because he's given a bunch of talks at our conference about Arrow. Um, really super excited about this. So everyone, please give a warm virtual welcome. You won't hear us all clapping. I'll golf clap for you. Please welcome Andy to give a talk tonight. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Happy to be here. Right. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. I'm sure somebody will tell me if not. Um, OK, so hi, I'm Andy Grove. I'm here to talk about Rust, Apache Arrow, and a project called Ballista that I've been working on for a while. So first, just a <clears throat> real quick introduction. So I've been a software engineer forever. Started off with some really obscure technology in the late 80s. I uh, moved to C++ for a while. And then I've been doing a lot of Java, JVM work for the past 20 years. And more recently, I got really excited about Rust. And at the same time, I was working with Scala and Spark, which is a really cool system. And this kind of got me thinking, well, Spark's really cool. But what if we had built Spark in Rust? And um, you know, what would that look like? And this really started a journey for me over the past few years where I started to build various pieces of data technology in Rust, trying to work towards this goal. And along the way, there's been a few different projects that have been created. Uh, starting with a SQL parser library. Um, so that's kind of a, a thing you need. Um, through this, then I discovered Apache Arrow, which seems really cool, but it wasn't a Rust implementation. So I was able to create the first, um, the first step as a, a Rust native implementation of Arrow. And then with those pieces in place, I moved on to another component called Data Fusion, which I heard there's a question there. And we're going to go into detail on Rust and Data Fusion and Arrow in the slides. And then ultimately, Ballista is the new project. And the thing I wanted to achieve at the start, which is building something like Apache Spark in Rust, this is now uh, the, the, the piece that's provided by Ballista. So, so I guess the first question is, why Arrow? So when I started on this journey, I actually started off with a very naive way of building a query engine, which was actually row-based. So when the queries are running, they're processing one row at a time. And it turns out that's really expensive. Um, so if you're looking at just a subset of columns in a table, um, there's a lot of overhead. You're loading all the data for each row into memory. You're skipping over the pieces that you're not interested in. Um, so columnar, columnar processing is just kind of the way people do it these days. And very quickly, somebody pointed me to Arrow. And Arrow makes a lot of sense. Um, many data projects already have some degree of support for Arrow although it's often for integration right now because obviously these projects were built, you know, maybe before Arrow was popular or mature. Um, but Arrow is really being adopted as the de facto standard for columnar data in memory and for kind of IPC and integration. So it seemed to make really good sense for me to just choose Arrow from the start for building this new data platform. And of course, I'm not the only person to think that Arrow is a good idea. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot of new projects over the next, you know, two or three years that are kind of built from the ground up to be Arrow native. And I'll, I'll share these slides afterwards, of course, but here are just a few of the projects um, that have chosen to use Arrow as their memory format. So the next question is, I guess, Arrow is cool, but why Rust? 
Um, as you saw from my background, I've been in, you know, using Java and JVM forever. It'd be kind of natural for me to use that. Um, Java's, you know, Java's really great. It's very productive. There's this really mature ecosystem. There's so many people out there that can build Java components. It has a lot going for it. Um, but unfortunately, it's not really suitable for big scale data processing, in my opinion, um, because of the garbage collection. Um, so the thing that drew me to Rust is that it has the similar performance to C++, but it has the, um, the it, has, it has a unique approach to memory management. It has the safety that you get with the garbage collector, but without the overhead. Um, I won't go into too much detail on how that works, but basically the Rust compiler tracks the memory allocation in your code. So if you're trying to do um, bad things in your code, your code won't even compile. So you don't have issues like freeing memory and then using it after it's freed. You don't have issues with multiple threads writing to the same piece of memory at the same time. So that's really cool. So you get the speed, you get the safety, and more importantly for big data and data processing, you get very predictable and consistent performance because there are no GC pauses. And you know, if on the downside, there is a steep learning curve, um, especially for some of the more advanced features and the language is still maturing. Okay, so now I'm going to take a bit of a deep dive into Apache Arrow, um, starting with the specification, but then going into kind of some Rust specific details. So the Arrow specification has kind of grown over time. It started out as a specification for a memory format. And basically, it's very efficient. Um, arrow, arrow structures, you know, Arrow presumably is a, a plain word array. Um, if you have fixed length, data types like integers or floats, then your values are stored in contiguously in memory in a buffer. And when you have variable length data, your data is still in a contiguous buffer, but now you have another buffer with the offsets for where the different values start and end. And having the contiguous memory makes the format very uh, suitable for processing, using vectorized processing on modern hardware. So using SIMD features on GPU, which is simultaneous input multiple data, Basically, the CPU can process multiple pieces of data with one instruction. And GPUs especially, I mean, they're designed for vectorized processing, so it's a very natural fit there too. So that's the kind of the memory format. Um, there's also an IPC format. So when you want to share this memory between two processes that are in different languages, you, you can share the memory form, you can share the memory directly because of the specification but you need to have some metadata describing the layout of the, the data structures. So the IPC specification provides a format for exchanging that metadata, um, but the data itself could be shared in memory, or if it does have to be serialized over the wire, it's kind of a zero copy operation because the memory format is also the serialization format. You can just stream those bytes to another process and it can then read them. And then more recently, um, there's a new flight protocol in Arrow. Um, so this is really exciting for me because this takes Arrow and makes it suitable for distributed processing. Uh, so flight is gRPC based, so protocol buffers, and it defines an interface for exchanging streams of Arrow data between processes and also um, methods for exchanging queries and exchanging metadata. Um, so Arrow has implementations in a ton of languages. I think it's like 12 or 13 at this point. Um, the C++ and the Java libraries are the most mature and some of the other libraries kind of reuse that. So the Python and R libraries, for example, delegate to C++. Um, so the libraries provide this memory format, but then we have computational kernels. So you have these data structures in memory in Arrow format. You want to perform operations on them. So maybe you want to add to arrays of integers or perform some aggregation. So some of these libraries, including C++, Java, and Rust, have these computational kernels in the libraries for you to use. And then the next layer up, uh, some of these libraries provide query engines. So I know the most about the Rust implementation into the data fusion query engine, but there's also a lot of work happening right now in the C++ implementation. So to dive into the Rust <clears throat> implementation in a little bit more detail, um, I'm gonna be showing some code examples. These are some of the key data types and structures involved. 
So Arrow has a type system. Um, so you have schemas, which are made up of fields. Fields have data types. They can be primitive or complex. Uh, for each type, there are builders provided for building arrays of that type. And I mentioned these compute kernels. So the Rust implementation has a bunch of those. So there's you know, math, string functions, filters, aggregation, and so on. And if you're dealing with tabular data, which you know, most of us are, there's a concept of a record batch. So these are batches of columnar data with a, a known schema. Um, when we look at those in a moment. And then also in the Rust library, we have some IO. So the ability to read and write CSV, JSON, Parquet to and from native Arrow for, uh, memory format. So here's a trivial example. So this is building uh, an Arrow array of 32-bit integers, signed integers. So we create a builder and then we can append values or append null values. And when you append null, you're not actually, um, well, depending on the data type in this case, there, there would be a mem memory used. But if you have variable length data, appending null means that you, you're not actually writing any data to the main buffer and your offset buffer would have two consecutive values the same to indicate that there's kind of a null value. So, so it's a very simple example. And then this is a trivial example of using a compute kernel. So here we're starting out with two arrays. We have an array of integers and we have an array of booleans. And here we're using a filter kernel to filter the array of integers based on the, the bit set provided by this Boolean array. So, you know, imagine how this is used in something like data fusion. If you run a query that has a where clause, um, you would um, evaluate the filter expression in the where clause to get your array of booleans and then pass that into a filter to filter the, the arrays in the record batches that you're processing. And the record batch structure is very simple. It contains a schema and then a vector of um, arrays. So in the Rust implementation, we use downcasting. So if you have an array ref, you need to know the schema. So you know what type you're dealing with. And then you can basically cast the array to a specific type and then access the, um, those type safe methods. So that's kind of a you know quick run through Arrow and the primitives provided there. Um, so now I want to go into Data Fusion, which is kind of the next level up the stack. So this is an in-memory query engine. It has a SQL and Data Frame API, and um, so we can query the the formats I mentioned previously. So CSV, Parquet, JSON. It can also process memory that's already sorry. It can process data that's already in memory, um, which is obviously incredibly efficient. So there's all kinds of Cool integrations you can do there. Um, we're using the Tokyo runtime for multi-threaded support. So it's a, an async library, um, which is working out really well. So looking at the architecture of data fusion specifically, it's you know very similar to any other query engine. Uh, the starting point is uh, building up a logical query plan. So you can do this through a data frame API. Um, which I, I would imagine many people here are familiar with. And in Data Fusion, if you use SQL, the SQL Query Planner actually just delegates to the Data Frame API. So regardless of which API you choose to use, you're gonna end up with basically the same query plan. Um, Data Fusion has some, um, some basic query optimizations, things like filter pushdown. So let's say you're joining two tables and you've got some predicates in your where clause it will try and apply those filters before you do the join to minimize the data being joined. Um, there's some other optimizations in there as well. Um, one of the really cool things with Data Fusion, especially with the 3.0 release that came out recently, is that there are a bunch of extension points now. So it's very easy to take Data Fusion and use it in another library or, or framework like Ballista um, and get all the Data Fusion functionality for free, but then extend it. Um, so in my case, in Ballista, I am taking Data Fusion and extending it for distributed query execution. So these are the, the operations we currently support in Data Frame. It isn't as rich as um, you know, some mature products out there yet, but it has enough to support quite a, a wide range of real world queries. So you can do you know, joins and aggregates and sorting and so on. So here's a, a code example for using the uh, data frame API. So it's, it's very simple. You, you create a context. 
um, then you can call methods on the context to access the initial data. So there's a read parquet method. Um, data Fusion also supports custom table providers. So you can write your own table providers to read from, uh, which is great for integration. And then you call other methods to um, basically build out your, your query plan. So the effect here of calling read parquet and select columns and filter, this isn't actually processing any data. It's just building up a query plan. And in the last line here, where we call collect on the data frame, that's where the query actually, the logical plan gets you know, translated to a physical plan and executed. And that returns a future, a Tokyo, uh, a Rust future um, that you can you wait on for the results. And here's a SQL example. So again, you start with the context. And so in SQL, you want to reference tables. So you need to register your data source as tables so that they can be referenced from SQL. So here we're registering a parquet file. Uh, we're giving it the table name, all types underscore plane. And then we can call a SQL method on the context, give it a SQL string, and we get back a data frame. Um, the data frame you get, so you can register any data frame as a table with the context as well. So you can kind of mix and match between data frame and SQL APIs. And again, this example is just calling collect at the end. Um, so collect brings the results back into memory. Um, the other options are you could have the results written out to any of the supported formats with a write method. Okay, so so far, um, so we've gone from the, the compute kernels to an in-memory query engine, so that's great. But the thing that I really wanted to do was make this distributed so that you can do Spark-like ETL processing or queries. So, um, so this is the eventual architecture diagram, um, and I'll explain in a minute what actually exists now and what doesn't. Um, but talking through this, this is the part where I am pretty excited about Arrow and the um, the potential it has for building out new systems. So the basic design of Ballista is that there is a cluster of distributed processes. The main components are the scheduler and the executor. They all have gRPC interfaces. Um, the executor support the Arrow flight protocol for streaming data. So the basic flow would be from a client in whatever language, um, you'd send a query plan, serialized as protocol buffers over the flight protocol to the scheduler the scheduler can then um, compile a physical query plan using data fusion. It can then translate it into a distributed query plan with extensions to data fusion to do that, and then start scheduling fragments of that query across the executors. And as each executor uh, executes a fragment of this query, the results get streamed to disk in Arrow IPC format. So again, Arrow is helping out. And the executors can stream that data between themselves and when the query finishes, the client, uh, the information that the client receives back from the scheduler isn't the actual result set. It's a list of locations full of results, which could be um, distributed across many executors. So this is one of the really cool things about the flight protocol. The client can now stream those results in parallel from all of the executors. So you don't have this kind of bottleneck of um, kind of forcing all the results back through a single driver process to get back to the client. Um, on the left-hand side, obviously, with because this is very standards-based, it will be possible to build drivers in you know any you know many different languages. Um, on the right-hand side of the diagram in the cluster, um, I've got some boxes there for like uh, Java, Python, and GPU. Um, so one of the really cool things is this scheduler in Ballista, even though it's implemented in Rust, it doesn't care what language the query gets executed in. Um, so it can send out these query plan fragments to any other process. So it'd be possible to execute parts of it in Java, because maybe you have some custom Java code that you need to call as part of a query. Um, or maybe you want to go to the GPU. Uh, so NVIDIA has this really cool Rapids QDF library, which is a GPU data frame library. So that can, um, that can simply slot in as well. So that's the eventual architecture, which I'm excited to get to. Um, what actually exists today is a little bit smaller. Um, so Ballista uh, 0.4 was just released a few days ago, and it's possible to execute distributed queries. Uh, there's a Rust client that supports SQL and Data Frame API, and there are some Python bindings for that Rust client as well. Um, so that's basically what we have today. 
Um, so to go into a little bit more detail about how this actually works, I've kind of mentioned some of this already. Um, and the design here, it's very much inspired by Apache Spark, particularly the adaptive query execution feature, which I think was new in 3.0. So basically, the um, so you have this whole query plan for your, your query needs to run. So there could be multiple nested joins. Your data could be partitioned differently at different stages of the query. So Ballista will break the query plan down into query stages. And uh, so what defines a query stage? A query stage is basically um, a set of operators that have the same partitioning. So those query stages can be executed in parallel across the cluster in a very scalable way. And the output of one query plan is the input for another query plan or maybe the eventual results. So you end up with this DAG of query stages that have to be executed. And one of the really nice things about this approach is that um, once you have executed the child, so let's say we're doing a join, the join has two inputs, the left and the right. Once you've executed those child query stages, you actually have like accurate statistics. So you know like how many bytes, how many rows, how many batches, um, maybe data on you know how sparse this is. And this allows you to apply optimizations dynamically as you're executing the query. Um, so for example, you know, if, if if one side of a join is really small, then maybe you'll just do a, a hash join. Um, but if the if if both sides are really large, you you're going to need a, a more scalable join algorithm. So you might need to do like a sort match join, for example. And as I mentioned earlier, all the so between these query stages, data needs to be kind of shuffled around between the executors, and that's where the arrow IPC format comes in of uh, the data being streamed between either between processes using flight or. If you know these executives, they could sometimes be co-located. So in that case, there are optimizations where it can stream directly from the local um, local shuffle files. And this diagram just shows the interaction in a bit more detail at the protocol level. So um, from client to scheduler, there's a gRPC interface, which isn't really part of the flight standard. Um, but there's, this is how the plan or SQL statement gets submitted, and a, a result um, gets returned with like a query ID. And then the client right now can poll the scheduler to see um, yeah, if the query is complete. And the scheduler uses the flight protocol to execute the partitions across the executors. And then the client or the executors can fetch those partitions using the flight protocol. So I got the invite from Jared to do this talk just uh, pretty recently. And this all kind of stemmed from somebody posting Ballista on Hacker News. And I wasn't really quite ready to like go this public with it, um, but for, it kind of acted as a forcing function for me to get a release out with, with help from a lot of other people. So the first the first really usable release of Ballista was just a few days ago, and it uses the latest and greatest Arrow data fusion code from GitHub directly. Um, it supports deployment as a standalone cluster. It supports Docker Compose and Kubernetes, and yes, it can actually execute distributed queries now. It supports, in theory, it supports all of the queries that Data Fusion supports, and um, it can run some real queries. So we have some benchmarks that are very loosely based on one of the industry standard benchmarks that people run with these tools, and I'll show some benchmark results soon. Um, but what we're seeing right now at this very early stage is that some of the queries are twice as fast as Spark, and others are considerably slower, um, which is to be expected because we haven't implemented all of the optimizations. Uh, that we need to do, like especially around join algorithms. And the current focus now is on, um, so it, you know, so it basically works. And now we have to do the work of adding support for different operations expressions and implementing these optimizations so that we can scale really well. So uh, here are my relatively fair benchmarks. And the reason I say that I've been through um, Ballista started a couple of years ago and it's a really kind of hacky prototype and it's kind of evolved and now it's becoming real. And throughout this time, I've always tried to run some benchmarks to kind of compare to Spark. And they've always been extremely unfair because um, Ballista couldn't do the things that Spark did. It wasn't distributed until recently. Um, so these are actually the first benchmarks that have run where Ballista is a, an actual cluster and Spark is running as a cluster. They have the same number of nodes, they're running the same hardware, running the exact same queries. Um, so the data set is relatively small, it's 100 gigabytes, and that's really the reason that this is still unfair. 
Uh, Spark is designed and optimized for big data and 100 gigs isn't really very big data. So, um, but still it gives a good indication. So currently, even with this very early release without the optimizations, we're kind of seeing we're kind of on par with Spark, a bit faster here, a bit slower there, but it's very promising um, for, the, for the future once we start to, to optimize this. So in terms of the roadmap and take all of this with a you know, pinch of salt, this is, we're very early on, but in my mind, this is the way I'm kind of looking at progress from today forward. So we have a 0 0.4 release that works and there's a whole bunch of kind of incremental improvement work we need to do there especially around things, especially with things like deployment and documentation and just some, there are some simple optimizations we need to make. And then I think what's really gonna be exciting is the kind of the next major release, the 0 0.5 release. That's where we get to the point that it is really a compelling alternative to Spark for queries against larger data. So in the terabyte scale. Um, so there's a few optimizations we need to get in to enable that. And this will be the release that uses a published version of Apache Arrow rather than uh, using the latest from GitHub. Um, I think a JDBC driver is really important. There, there is a prototype that worked at one point and currently is broken. Uh, but with a JDBC driver, you can start using business intelligence tools, things like Clear or Tableau to actually run queries against the data. And, um, and the thing I'm really excited about is GPU support. So I mentioned Rapid's QDF. They have a GPU data frame library you give it a query plan, it executes it. Lista has a query plan. So the basic process is to um, have an executor running that can take the Lista query plan, translate it to a QDF query plan and execute it. Um, QDF conveniently is built based on Arrow. So it's pretty much the same date, the memory format. So it should be incredibly efficient to move data back and forth. And then of course, 1.0, everything else. And so, I guess we'll see how it goes. There's a community building around the project. We've had <clears throat> contributions from around 30 people so far. I think there are uh, six or seven people that are pretty active right now. So there's all these features we need to build. It's hard to predict a timeline because everybody's working on it as a kind of volunteer effort. I work on it in my spare time. Um, but I'm excited that we have, we've kind of reached a critical mass. Now we have the, the basic stable product and now there's some momentum. So I'm, yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what happens over the remainder of 2021. So I think that's kind of, um, I've maybe blasted through that a little quickly, but that's basically the presentation. Um, and now there's a shameless plug for my book. So I wrote a, a book about query engines a while back. It's just an introductory guide, but it walks through kind of all the steps of building a query engine from passing SQL to how, you know, what query plans look like how optimizations work and so on. And I found it's been a really good way to kind of share, I guess, share my view of how, um, how these query engines get built or how they're designed. And by people reading this, it makes it easier for them to contribute to the project as well. So, so yeah, so if you're interested, check that out, it's on LeanPub. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening, there's some links there. Um, I'm assuming I'll be able to share the slides afterwards. So thank you. Great, thank you very much for the talk. Um, big round of virtual applause from everybody. And I guess I'll be the only one on microphone and video, but thank you very much for, uh, for that talk. Uh, so we have a handful of questions. I am going to uh, go through them. This one's not a question, but it's a comment that it's a great book and helps someone with no experience with query engines understand how they work. So, hey, kudos to you, great compliment on there. Very kind, thank you. Yep, yep, so thank, thank you, uh, Ken, for that nice compliment. Then um, this seems to be a question about code. Um, what is dot await? It was um, after collect. Yes. Okay. So um, so in Rust, Rust uh, has uh, some great async support. So you can have uh, you can have you can call a method and have it return a future. And dot await basically makes your code um, wait for that eventual future to happen, and then it will carry on processing. Um, but the whole the whole point of this Rust async kind of ecosystem is that you're not your code isn't like blocking a thread waiting for the results. Um, that thread goes off to process other code that's ready to run. And when you, when your future is ready, your your code will get woken up again. And it's really a fantastic thing about Rust and the, and the Tokyo runtime. It it makes it very um, 
it, it feels really odd saying this about Rust and Futures, but it actually makes it very easy to build very scalable code without being an expert in async in a way. Great. Yeah, async is difficult. Yes. Yep. Uh, there is some async in R that some of us are getting used to, but it's, you know, it's hard. Um, another question, this is sort of being asked uh, before you came on, uh, Neil was able to answer some of the questions, but can the Rust client read and write nested columns in Arrow? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I was, so Arrow can, the Rust Arrow client can deal with nested types. There are, uh, there are some limitations I know. Um, one of the committers is working or is working on some improving the parquet support for writing nested types. But the Arrow library itself does support nested types. Data Fusion does not yet. Um, so for Data Fusion to support nested types, somebody is going to have to go in and do some work um, like on the SQL planner to understand uh, like compound object names and map flows to the, we need like a new construct in the logical plan. So no, it's not there. It'd be relatively easy to implement that if somebody was, um, if that was an important feature for somebody. Okay. Um, that same person asked the question, how can people contribute? <laughs> Fantastic question. So um, I would definitely encourage people to go to the Apache Arrow website and join the Apache Arrow mailing list. That would be a really kind of great place to start. Um, so to, to give an idea, so like Balistra is actually a tiny code base right now. I think it's about uh, 7,000 lines of code, but the, it's leveraging all of this great stuff in Arrow and Data Fusion. Um, and there's plenty of work to do there. Um, so it'd be great. There's, uh, we use Jira to track all the issues. Um, but the best thing is join the mailing list, say hello. Um, yeah, ask, ask, you know, where is help needed? I myself have contributed um, issues to that Jira tracker. Fantastic. I discovered a bug in it and immediately prompted Neil to go take a look at it. Uh, and, they got, and they fixed it really fast. It was impressive how fast, like within a day. Uh, so good, good for them. Um, another question here is, um, where did this go? All right. Are you working on, all those pro on this project as part of your NVIDIA job or just for fun in your personal time? This is just for fun in my personal time right now. So what are you working on in NVIDIA? I'll follow up on that question. Sure. So I can't go into too much detail of that probably, but just at a very high level. So we, uh, I work on the Rapids Accelerator for Apache Spark. It's basically an Apache Spark plugin that makes Spark run on the GPU. So it translates Spark query plans into QDF query plans, um, makes stuff run faster. And so that's, that's like a really cool thing. I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that I'm doing similar things in my day job and in my spare time, it's through my spare time work that I kind of got to NVIDIA, I guess. Um, and I'm excited about adding the GPU support to Ballista because I kind of know how to do it from the day job. So it's kind of a natural, you know, so it's kind of a natural thing to do it here as well. Um, I have this kind of possibly naive um, hope that I can add GPU support to Ballista. The thing becomes really popular and it becomes interesting to NVIDIA, but that's just my, you know, naive hope. Who knows? That would be nice. You know, I've been, uh, I, I told Andy this, but for everyone else, I've been uh, asking NVIDIA a long time to have, uh, GPU data frames are R. So hopefully, I'm hoping that this is the thing that makes it happen. Um, and speaking, there's a question here. This, this is a question that says, what are the target dates for 0 0.5 and 1.0? There are no target dates because it's a, a spare time project is my answer. One thing I've learned, so this journey, this has like been three years is to get to the point where Bidistra actually works. Um, so I'm incredibly happy like over the past couple of weeks it's got to this point. Um, but like I've learned, you have to pace yourself um, you can't treat your spare time project as a job because you just get so frustrated. So, you know, I get excited about a feature. I go off and try and implement it like some weekend. It doesn't work out. I get frustrated. I walk away for a bit. I come back when I feel like it. And, you know, it gets delivered when it gets delivered. And there are other people doing the same. So, sorry, no dates. Hmm. All right. That's fair. And then given, are you even able to get your hands on a GPU to test this? Because it seems like no one can get a GPU these days. Uh, this is one, one advantage of working at NVIDIA. I was able to get myself an RTX 3080 from the employee store. Nice. That's how so I got I mine also. Um, okay. I, was in the, I was at the headquarters and they, they walked me past the gift shop. And this back when they had a 1080 Ti. And I, I saw it sitting on the shelf. I'm like, I'm going to get a 1080 Ti. and just bought it when I was on the tour. Very cool. Yeah, I was given, being given a tour by some of the employees. Uh, someone said no 3090. There were 3090s from Cheapskate. <laughs> fair. That's fair. All right. Um, then we have a question. Um, any plan to support more 
Marla, any plan to support more operators additional to the relational operator? For instance, this archive paper, which I can't, that doesn't help you. It summarizes the data frame algebra. I guess, are you at, I, I'm not quite, maybe you know more that's what's asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I would give the very kind of um, vague answer, sure. Um, I mean, so I guess my view on it. So I, so SQL and data for by basics, I mean, SQL is really the starting point. Um, but people need to run the custom codes. So the next step in my mind is like supporting UDFs, column the UDFs, so user defined functions. Um, but then after that, you want to have more flexibility. So you want to be able to run operations that run on entire partitions or entire batches. Um, so yes, you need all of those kind of extension points for running your own code. And at that point, um, so that, that's kind of an important point when you're building a project like this, I think it's important just to figure out these extension points because once you have the extension points in there, then other people can go and do crazy things and um, do what they need to do. And, and it, it makes it easier to put in new features like that. Yep. And then I'll follow that one up with the UDFs. Is that just, let's say we wrote a custom R function, which did an arbitrary code. Hmm. I call from the R side that somehow that gets planned and executed by whatever engine's running it. Exactly, yeah. So, so kind of looking through how that would work when the ballista scheduler gets the query, it would recognize it's referring to some R function. Um, so when it sends the query plan to the executors, it will have that information. The executor would need, would need some way to invoke that R function. I don't know how that would work, whether it would be through some kind of FFI call, foreign function interface, whether it would have to you know, talk to another process through shared memory or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, the executor would need to know how to invoke that code locally. So like if it's an R function, there might need R in the executor. If it's a Python function, they need to be Python in the executor. Yeah, exactly. So like if you're running in Kubernetes, maybe you've got your district executor and some R process running in the same pod. Um, they can communicate with, you, with each other somehow, whether it's through shared memory or networking um, or directly calling a lib. Cool. And then that actually is a nice segue in, uh, about shared memory. Uh, does the data need to be written to disk to be sent to executor, executors? Or can it be done through shared memory? So you I mean, the answer like writing to disk earlier. And yeah, so I mean today, so and again, this is like extremely early. Um, but today, so yeah, today the, the initial data has to be on disk. Um, it only supports reading from like Parquet and CSV. So it starts from disk, it applies all the operations. The data is currently persisted back to disk between each query stage. Um, there is a, an issue open for adding support for just keeping it in memory, because if you have you know, maybe you do have kind of smaller data and you just want speed. That's just, you know, that's a good optimization. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I've really answered the question, but right now yeah, it has to start on disk and it is persisted between stages. Okay. All right, I know there is an IO you're gonna hit when you, know, you have to write to disk. Um, a question about for distributed teams is schema registries a best practice? And could you just explain more about schema registries? Sure. So the scheduler right now can use uh, etcd as a backing store um, for things like the cluster state and queries that are currently being processed. And I think we we'll probably extend that to storing metadata about schemas. So I mentioned with SQL, you know, in SQL statements, you, you want to reference tables by name. So you, need, you do need this kind of registry that maps table names to some schema and the firewall locations in the cluster. Um, so yes, you, you need to have that kind of registry. and, and Right now, the yeah, FCD is kind of where we're going to be storing that. So you can have multiple schedulers running and they all have access to the same shared state. Okay. Um, how does the flight ensure results are in the correct order without a spark driver? It's, oh, that's, that's a great question. So in general, it doesn't. If so, yeah, if you're running a query that finishes with an order by and you want your client to receive ordered data, um, actually, there was a, had a discussion, I forget if it's in a, PR, in a GitHub issue or not, um, but the data from each executor would be in order. So you'd be doing a sort on each executor, and then you would need to, you would need to use a sort merge join algorithm. So from the client, you can stream all the data in parallel across the executors, you know each stream is ordered. So basically the sort merge algorithm, you just read, like you look at the first item in each stream, compare them, take the lowest one, repeat until you've read all the data. Okay. Um, any like scientific algorithms that could be distributed, like a distributed XG boost, a distributed linear regression even, or distributed distance matrix? So this is where I, uh, I don't have experience in that area, so I, I cannot answer that one. My background is very much more the kind of traditional ETL SQL kind of thing. So. Okay. 
So now a lot of those things are distributable because you're just somehow getting the framework to do it, which you know, mm -hmm. that, that's beyond me. I'm sure it's possible whether it's efficient or not. I have no idea. Fair, that's another question. Yeah. Um, I do remember I went to a talk a few years ago. Uh, someone from Lazada was saying, Eugene, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name now, saying that they have some of the largest data in the world, but they use Spark to get it ready. By the time they're ready to fit an XG boost, it fits on a single machine. Hmm. And you don't need to distribute anymore. But some people like XGBoost does distribute it across GPUs for a reason. Um, here's one. One advantage of Spark is that it can pack UDFs for their dependencies into a single jar and distribute to executors. How will Ballista support UDFs of arbitrary dependencies? You sort of touched upon it. So I guess this Yeah, is so so I, I have kind of mixed views on that because I have experience from previous jobs of managing kind of spark clusters where there are all these jars flying rooms and no version control. And then it can, it's really great when you're doing kind of ad hoc stuff, you're testing, but it can also be a nightmare in production. Um, so there are, I guess, yeah, there are kind of two, two things I see happening, two different features, which will come at different times. Uh, what I would like to do first is have a way of packaging, um, packaging the dependencies in Docker images. Um, so when you deploy your executors, you, you have your own Docker image, you extend the executor Docker image, you put, your, you know, all your dependencies in there. So when the executor is running, it, it has a means to invoke your code. Um, but, but I think it is really important also to have the ability to just have code on your clients and have that magically streamed into the cluster. So you've got your Lambda expressions in whatever language. Um, so I think we do need to support that as well. I, I know Rust Lambdas can be serialized. I don't have experience much with like Python and R and how that would really work. I, I, know, have the, I know how it works in Java. So yeah, technically we can support those things. Um, yeah, and I, I imagine we would have to do all of that at some point. All right, thank you. Um, oh, someone asked, what, how about Wasm for packaging? Right, Wasm WebAssembly, I'm really excited about that, but unfortunately I know nothing about it really other than a few blog posts I've read. Um, there are some other people involved in the project who are excited about it. Um, I'm pretty sure we will do something with it, but it's like very, I think a little bit too early to have specific, um, you know, more, any kind of concrete answer about where we're going to go with that. All right. So a pull request, <laughs> you'll take that. <laughs> yeah. If somebody has ideas, yeah, please come along. Yep. That's, you hear it folks, give the ideas. All right. I'll give everyone a last chance to get squeeze one more question in under the wire. So we will sit here and look at each other awkwardly through the camera, waiting for a few moments, just to give everyone a chance. Um, and I'll take this time. I want to thank Andy. He did allude to it that I asked him to speak of just a few weeks ago. And he had to not only write a whole talk, but like actually make, you know, uh, get out a whole new release for this talk. So let's give him a round of applause and a spare time doing both of those things. I'll thank give you. you. Yeah, it's been an exciting couple of weeks. Yes, yes, it's been cool seeing that. Um, one of us says systems work. A wonderful systems work, they say. All right, so it looks like I'm just going to stall for another like 10 seconds and see if I see anyone's typing. I don't think I do. So I think we got a, got a lot of good questions in there. So I'll just do a few reminders before we sign off. Remember, folks, videos are up. Conference videos at rstats.ai, meetup videos at myhackr.org. If you want to help us make it look better, it's a GitHub repo. Send us a pull request. We would love to get that. Uh, next three months, are uh, going to be Eric, uh, Garrick out in blue, Boo. Hi, love. Sorry, I have a little uh, toddler coming in here. He can come here. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna see a, a toddler as I give a finishing announcements here. He's ready for bed and should be in bed, but he's not. So he'll get he gotta learn a little bit about stats this way. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Good job. Uh, so March is gonna be about Sharingan. April is gonna be about Rust, calling Rust from R. May will be about light yes. GBM in R. Yes. <laughs> and someone wants to order Andy a, for, uh, Andy a talk for the a pizza for the talk. Yeah. So whoever wants to give Andy a pizza, uh, find him on Twitter and, and DM him or something. Daddy. Yes. I'm sorry, love. Give Daddy one second. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great time. And very much thank you, Andy, for giving this wonderful talk. I had a great time. Hope everyone else did too. And virtual applause for you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.